Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Welcome to another career building webinar brought to you by the Australian Water School. I'm Trevor Pillar, and today it's all about coastal water quality modelling. So great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us from over 35 countries. It looks great. See it on the map there. Before we start, I just want to remind everyone there's a lot of two flow webinars coming up. Um, you can see them there. I won't go through them individually, but each month is another fantastic um, team from two flow bringing you the latest in uh, modeling. All right, let's get into this. Michael, Mitchell, Emma, please come on screen and say hi. Uh, Michael is from the northern part of Australia in Queensland. Mitchell is from somewhere in Victoria. Yeah, right. I think Victoria. No, no, Brisbane. 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 Yeah. Brisbane. Yeah. Brisbane, Emma. Still, uh, still Brisbane, Emma? Yes, still yes, Brisbane. I can tell by the sunny smile. Sunny Queensland. <laughs> yes, great. I love it. <laughs> great team. Thank you guys for joining us, guys, girls. Uh, it's fantastic to have a team like this. Um, there is a poll, and I appreciate everyone in the webinar uh, today joining us and, and doing this poll. Um, any, any comments from uh, yourself, Michael, Mitchell, Emma, on these answers? Government policy, commercial consulting. Yeah, looks about right. That's that's good. Um, yep. Yeah, it seems like the majority of our of our um, attendees are between sort of five and twenty years experience, which is great. Yep. Great. Yep, it's good. Floodplain modelling wins there. Yeah, yeah, but we've still got pretty strong coastal and estuarine and urban as well, which is great. It is good. A good, good blend. Yeah. Good, and we do have someone who's 100% of their job is water quality modelling. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be, that'd make you smile. I'm I happy, can imagine yeah. that. Yeah, I can make you <laughs> that. All right, that's great. Look, that's really appreciate everybody. Thank you for taking the time to do that poll. No other comments on that, Mitchell, Emma? All good? No, it's all good. It's a yeah, nice mixture of uh, 1D, 2D, yep. 3D modelers out there too. So it's great to have you here today. So it really helps with how to shape this webinar as we're going through it. So thanks very much for that, Paul. That's great. All right. Mitchell and Emma are going to be going flat chat, answering your questions, comments. Um, make them interesting. Make them hard. I want to see this. This is really good. Because if what they can't do, they're going to hand back to Michael at the <laughs> no. Q&A time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I'll leave Mitchell and Emma to go to that and hand over to you, Michael. Is that good? Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. We're done with yep. everything. That's all good. Thank you for that. I'll um, leave you to it. That's good. Coming through fine. You can see it. Great. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. And thank you all for coming along. I really do appreciate it. It's great to see so many people here today. Today, we will talk a little bit about coastal water quality modelling. Um, and um, what we'll do is... Um, talk about what coastal water quality is um, and some of the drivers or motivations we have for managing that water quality in the coastal zone. But then what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about um, what we need to do to respond in actually appropriately managing that water quality. Uh, and we'll do so by looking at, at three numerical modeling examples of typical or common water quality issues that arise uh, in day-to-day uh, in, in -day, um uh, workflows of people in government and consulting and research. So hopefully we can use those examples to illustrate uh, what, what we mean by water quality modelling in the coastal zone and, and to talk about some outcomes um, of those. So what, what is coastal water quality? Well, I think it's fair to say, um, particularly looking at the poll results there, Trevor, that um, we are, as a community, fairly familiar with water movement and physics. So that's tides and currents and salinity and temperature, whether it be in lakes or, or the oceans or, or estuaries or whatever it might be, we're fairly familiar with water movement, but less so with water quality. But, but we can say, I think that we do like as people, we do like good water quality um, or healthy water. And the image on the right hand side, there is an example of healthy water uh, and it's clear. Uh, and there's a beautiful seagrass meadow uh, being, um, growing on, on the sediments there. And that, that looks like healthy water. And we like that. Um, we like less poor water quality or, or unhealthy water. And the images on the right there are just an example of some less healthy water. Um, we have certainly some, some algal activity in this lagoon. And it's fairly turbid and, 
and our vegetation isn't isn't 100 and we also have an example here of a pollutant plume that's discharging from a pipe these are these are things we like less and, and we're not quite as comfortable or, or, or happy with this level of water quality but what does it actually mean well some common pollutants or or indicators of poor water quality are high turbidity and that means sediment suspended in the water and that can cause light cutting and discoloration like like on the right hand side image there and we can also see algal blooms occur um, in the coastal ocean and, and lakes and estuaries and elsewhere, but those algal blooms can be um, toxic to ecology uh, and toxic to people as well. Uh, and if not toxic, they can certainly uh, sometimes cause skin irritation on contact with people. So we don't like algal blooms too much either. Um, Ballast uh, water releases um, from shipping vessels uh, can also cause or result in the introduction of exotic plants and animals into marine environments that they might not um, normally exist in. And that's, that's a form of, of water pollution or poor water quality where plants and animals start um, uh, living in areas that they're not, they're not usually found in. And also, in general, low dissolved oxygen concentrations in waterways is poor. We, we usually like to see high dissolved oxygen concentrations in water because animals and plants need oxygen to live and survive. So that, that's what we like to see. So how do we describe these impacts? We, we've talked about what we do and don't like and, and what some poor uh, water quality outcomes might be, but how do we describe these subsequent impacts? Well. In general terms, not, not always, but in general terms, we do like to talk about impacts in, in one of three ways. And the first is acute toxicity. And acute toxicity is when um, there is immediate effect, a detrimental effect on, on the ecology of a particular area as a result of a water quality problem. An example is a fish perhaps swimming through a pollutant plume that is toxic to the fish. The fish will die straight away. And, and we have some of those in the image on the right hand side. So that's acute, that's immediate, that's straight away. We also have chronic toxicity and, and chronic means long-term. So it's not, it's not immediate, but chronic is, is uh, ecological degradation that happens over time, uh, weeks, months, years. And one example is a progressive depletion of seagrass meadow extents in a particular area in response to whatever environmental driver that might be. It doesn't happen straight away, but it does happen. Um, so that's acute toxicity, chronic tox toxicity. And then the third area we like to talk about is human health. And, and clearly we, we want to be managing our environment so that we minimise or, or eliminate human health consequences. Uh, and we talked about a couple of those with regards to algal blooms uh, in the previous slide. But the end result is that whether we've got acute chronic toxicity or human health impacts, the end result is we have a loss of biodiversity, um, which is undesirable. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And we can also motivate human health concerns, which are, which are clearly undesirable. So we need to manage our coastal water quality to avoid these sorts of situations. So a little bit more about those drivers for why we need to manage our coastal water quality. Well, I think um, that one of the highest, uh, most important drivers for managing our water quality in the coastal zone is that as people living today, we have a custodianship role for making sure that the generations that follow us can enjoy the natural environment as much as we have. Um, and at the, in, the issue of intergenerational conservation or intergenerational equity is really important. We, we do have that obligation to, to make sure that future generations um, can enjoy what we have. Um, and perhaps one way of thinking about this is that's the carrot. That's the nice way of thinking about things. And that's sort of a, a good way of motivating us to get out of bed every morning and go to work is that we can do something to help future generations uh, in the environmental space. That's the carrot. The stick, of course, is that we have to. We have to look after our coastal uh, water quality um, because of regulation. And regulation um, is laws, uh, essentially. And whilst regulation does vary from country to country and even within states, uh, between states within countries, um, the, the concept of the idea of regulation is that governments at whatever level pass laws that mean that we need to protect our environment particularly, or in this case, the coastal environment. Uh, and, and usually those laws uh, trigger uh, environmental investigations uh, around proposed developments. 
that might be a new port or a, a new a dredging shipping lane, or it might be an aquaculture facility or whatever it might be. The moment that we start to propose to interact with the environment, particularly in the coastal zone, we have to follow the laws that apply to protecting the environment in that area. Uh, and those laws um, require different levels of detail, depending on the scale of the development usually, or the level of government. Um, but typically those levels of government will be local government or county or municipality uh, at, the, at the lowest level. And then we move up to state level and then federal level, which is at a country level. And all those different levels will have different requirements about how we must conduct ourselves and future proposals uh, in the marine environment in the coastal zone. At the end of the day, if we don't get our environmental approvals through these legal processes, then no development can occur. Uh, so no approvals equals no development. And what this is representative of is the nexus of making money or, or having an economy that's healthy versus conserving our natural asset, assets. And that's really what uh, one of the intents of these laws are, is to make sure that we don't completely shut down an economy to protect the environment 100%. But what we do do in the environment in terms of impacts is mitigated or minimised and managed appropriately. And that's what these laws are about. And they're the stick. We have to do these things. So if we have this intergenerational obligations or if, if these laws apply to us that we need to meet uh, with regards to coastal water management, what are we going to do about it? Well, if we do have a proposal before us, um, and we are seeking those environmental approvals, we do need to undertake some sort of environmental assessment before the proposal is approved. And like I said before, that can vary in detail and scope. However, they are typically multi-pronged. And what I mean by that is that there's many components that make up these environmental assessments. Um, there's data collection synthesis, there's expert opinion, there's research and stakeholder engagement and numerical modeling. And we'll be talking about numerical modeling today. Um, modeling is only one part of the, of, the, of the whole makeup of environmental uh, impact assessments, but it's an important part, but it's not the only part. And we should, with very large degree of caution, uh, rely solely on numerical modeling predictions uh, in these assessments. We should always use numerical modeling predictions in conjunction with all the other tools I've listed here so that we can come up with a, an integrated and an appropriate management framework for the proposal that we might have in front of us. And on the right-hand side, there's an example of an aquaculture operation where clearly there'll be environmental impacts that are being mitigated and managed appropriately. So if we are going to use numerical models as part of this impact assessment process, we're gonna talk a little bit about how they're used and then we're gonna look at some examples of those uses. Uh, to do so, we'll use a two-flow set of tools um, and we'll be focusing entirely on two-flow FE FE stands for finite volume. Um, and we'll be using uh, four primary components of that two flow FE suite. Uh, and that is the hydrodynamics, I might refer to that as HD, um, sediment transport module or STM, the water quality module or WQM, and the particle tracking module, PTM. They all do different things, and we'll talk about each of those in a second. Um, but this two flow FE model that we'll be working with. Um, is one that Mitch actually presented to us previously uh, a couple of months ago in his 3D coastal modeling webinar as part of this series. Um, so I won't spend too much time on the hydrodynamics because Mitch has done that for us. But I will say that um, it's a fully three-dimensional hydrodynamic model uh, and uh, it's using the, the finite volume or flexible mesh scheme. Um, I've got the details of the model listed on the left-hand side here. <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through those in detail. But I will say that um, the model is not um, a standalone model um, in terms of its geographical location. It's actually integrated into the wider oceanic circulations of its location, which is the east coast of Australia. And the diagram, the, the image on the right hand side there shows us that, how the model domain, which is inside this black box here, inside the black box, that's the model domain, which we'll see lots of today, is actually seamlessly knitted into uh, the oceanic circulations around it so that we get the correct driving and forcing inside that domain as we go forwards. Uh, and what we'll be really looking at in terms of these model predictions uh, is uh, temperature, salinity and light um, from the hydrodynamic model. Uh, and here's a zoomed in image of the model mesh around an area that we'll be particularly focusing on, which is um, this uh, river exit um, into the wider, the wider coastal ocean. We'll be looking at lots of results in this area right here. 
Okay, so that was hydrodynamics. Um, the sediment transport module or STM um, is a module available with two flow FE and uh, it simulates all those processes I have listed there. Um, but today we'll just be simulating one sediment fraction. It can do multiple, but we'll just do one and it's for illustrative purposes only. Um, but whenever we talk about sediment results, we've used the sediment transport module. Now the water quality module, this is the focus of um, our webinar today is water quality modeling. And the water quality module is, um, is part of the two flow FE suite. Um, and we, we may well ask ourselves the question, why do we need water quality modeling? Why can't we just use passive traces and say, well, we've, we've got an infection dispersion scheme. We're just gonna simulate passive traces um, representing nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever it might be, and that'll be enough. Well, the reason we can't do that is because passive traces are exactly that, they're passive. Then they are entirely conservative, which means that they don't transform in the environment in concentration. Um, whilst we can apply uh, rudimentary decay rates to some traces in some models and even settling rates, if that makes sense, they're not truly able to represent water quality processes because water quality processes are all integrated as one and traces cannot capture the integration required to mimic and simulate ecological processes. So as an example here, um, we can talk about sediment biological activity. So we know that an environmental system um, microbes live in the soil down here in the sediment underneath the water column and they're alive and so they consume um, organic matter and they consume oxygen when they do that. So we know that oxygen in the water column is consumed in the sediments and when that happens we know the sediments produce nutrients and when the nutrients are produced we know that they can be taken up by phytoplankton and in fact even after phytoplankton has taken up those nutrients when the phytoplankton dies or uh, excretes those, those nutrients can go back into the water column or back into dissolved oxygen pools. In other words, all these components here are non-conservative. Oxygen concentrations change as a result of what nutrients are doing or what phytoplankton is doing, and nutrient concentrations change as a result of what phytoplankton and oxygen are doing. So they're all interrelated and they're non-conservative, and that's why we need water quality models. Passive traces will not suffice. We'll talk about some of these processes more today. So in terms of those transformative or non-conservative processes that we simulate in the water quality module, uh, it, it's able to simulate atmospheric exchange of, of nitrogen, phosphorus and oxygen, um, as well as sediment exchange. Um, but what we'll really be focusing on today is internal processing. And the parts of the internal processing the water quality module can handle is mainly um, are, are, are extensive, but the ones we're mainly talking about today are transformations between organic and inorganic nutrients and the growth of phytoplankton in response to uh, nutrient concentrations. So we're really focusing on nutrients and phytoplankton growth in the water quality module today, even though it can do much more. But the basic premise, as it says here, is to try and simulate ecologically relevant transformative processes um, to support environmental management or su uh, support environmental impact assessment. And that's why we have water quality models. So that aside, so what, what are we actually simulating? We're simulating dissolved oxygen, silicate, uh, nutrients, uh, organic matter and phytoplankton as I have listed here. Uh, and we'll see in some animation shortly that we'll be able to simulate phytoplankton um, that might look a little bit like this uh, floating algae image here. Doesn't look very good, but that's hopefully what we'll be able to simulate uh, as we go forward. Okay, so we've talked about the hydrodynamics, the sediment transport and water quality modules. Now, very briefly, the particle tracking module. Um, all it is, is um, uh, a module that inserts or, or seeds um, the hydrodynamic flow field with particles that represent non-dissolved quantities. So uh, we're not talking about dissolved nutrients or dissolved organic matter. We're talking about particulates like solid waste or turtles or shrimp or gross pollutants or things like that. Uh, and in the case that we'll look at shortly, we'll be talking about marine pests. So they're things that are transported by the hydrodynamic field, but are not dissolved. Uh, and that's the PTM. So the overall process about how we bring all these things together is that we will, um, on the left-hand side, we'll simulate hydrodynamics first. Uh, we'll make sure that model's doing well in terms of its calibration. And then we will launch into water quality, sediment transport and particle tracking, mod, um, particle tracking modeling. And we'll have a look at the performance and predictions of those models and possibly feed back to hydrodynamics, redo hydrodynamics, 
and then redo our water quality sediment particle modeling until we're happy with this overall suite of models and what they're predicting and how they're going about predicting it. Once we're at that point, we're then able to use these models to support management decisions or impact assessments. Again, not the sole and only tool we'd use, but certainly one of the tools we would use to support management um, decisions and actions is this combination of hydrodynamics, water quality, sediment transport and particle tracking. Okay, so let's try and get a bit more concrete about this and look at some common issues or common examples of where we might use water quality models in the coastal environment. Needless to say, there are many. There are many applications or many possible uh, uh, scenarios that we might look at in terms of coastal water quality, but they're often project or proposal specific. Um, so what, what I've done is I've, I've uh, come up with three examples um, that we'll look at to try and understand and, and, and illustrate how our water quality models can operate in the coastal zone. The first is uh, the riverine delivery of catchment dry pollutants um, to the coastal zone. And we have an image on the right hand side there of uh, from our model actually that shows a river discharging some pollutants uh, into the open ocean. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, that's the first one. The second one is that release of exotic marine plants or animals uh, from ship ballast water as ships um, track paths around the coast. Uh, and the third case study or, or example we'll look at is the proposed aquaculture farm um, in this model that we've, that we've talked about. Um, there's no suggestion that any of these um, scenarios have happened in the past or will happen in the future. They're entirely hypothetical. Um, and I've just um, created, those, I've created these for the purpose of this webinar. Um, there's no suggestion otherwise. Okay, uh, example number one is about riverine pollutant delivery. So the basic idea is that when it rains, rains uh, the rain will fall on the land, the land will generate runoff. When that runoff is generated, it will um, accumulate pollutants as it moves through the landscape and then deliver those pollutants to the coastal ocean uh, when the river discharges to the coastal zone. Uh, we're looking at the water quality impacts associated with that sort of process. So the scenario, the real life or real world scenario um, in this hypothetical example, the real world scenario would be that a marine authority uh, wishes to better understand the impact of a large riverine inflow uh, to local biota and also to human health. So we're getting back to that acute toxicity, chronic toxicity, human health um, division we talked about before. So a marine authority wants to better understand the system it manages. So what we've done is we've set up the model um, of this area on the east coast of Australia to simulate two fresh inflows. There are others obviously that do flow into this model from the, from the catchments, but we haven't included those in the model. We've just included the Burnett River is the orange, the Mary River is the brown. Uh, we've used 3D model, hydrodynamic sediment transport and water quality models. And we, we'd be looking at results from a nine day simulation period. Uh, that period is January, 2013, which is when ex-tropical cyclone Oswald uh, traveled, tracked south along the Queensland coast. And it delivered a lot of rain to the catchments that then flow, flowed through those rivers and out into the coastal zone. So we're trying to mimic that event. Um, so on in those inflows, um, to the Burnett River and the Mary River. We uh, obviously uh, seeded the model or set the model to have a freshwater inflow for those two locations. Um, and these are the flow rates that we applied. And they are large. The Burnett River has a, a peak flow there of more than 16,000 cubic meters a second, which is substantial. Um, so that gives you an idea of the scale of this, of this rainfall event. So we added those flows to the model. Um, to those flows, we attached a sediment concentration, assuming that as those flows moved through the system on land, they picked up sediment as they went. And we also added a nutrient concentration um, so that when the water got out into the coastal ocean, we could have some nutrients there and see what they did. So we set the model up with freshwater sediment and nutrients being delivered by the Burnett, Mary, Burnett River and the Mary River. And what we'll be looking at in terms of outputs, uh, salinity, uh, sediment, light and chlorophyll and they use all the different um, models that we've just talked about. Okay, so um, let's look at the model predictions uh, for what happens when these, the Burnett River and the Mary River discharge into the coastal ocean. The first thing we'll do is look at salinity. Now, what I'll do here is I will take a little bit of time to explain this figure on the right because I'm gonna use it over and over again. So this figure on the right, it will contain an animation, which I'll play shortly, but it will always have um, two panels. And the top panel 
is looking down on the two flow FE model to the surface layer or the surface um, values. Um, and those values from the model are represented by colors. And those colors are shown on the color bar here from zero to 35, in this case, it's salinity. So red is 35 parts per thousand and blue is zero. So in other words, salt water is red and fresh water is blue. Um, so that's what this panel on the top is. It's looking down on top of the model from the, from the air. Um, it also has a wind, a wind vane here. And this arrow here will move as the animation progresses. And the arrow shows the direction that wind is blowing towards. Uh, blowing two in the model as applied to the model and the length of the, the shaft of the arrow uh, is an indication of the strength of the wind. So a very short shaft would be a low wind and long would be a higher wind. There's a north arrow here to give you some uh, geographical positioning and here's a scale bar of 20 kilometers. So in this top pane, um, this is a 20 kilometer distance for your reference. Now the other things we have in the top pane here is the letters A and B and a, a line you can see moving around between A and B that goes out into the ocean and comes back again. This is a line that um, represents vertical information from the model and is presented in the window, uh, the second window at the bottom here. And this second window is a vertical curtain. It's a vertical curtain that runs from A to B. So A is on the left-hand side and B is on the right-hand side of the curtain. And the color contours are the same scale um, as in the top figure, which is, which is the color bar up here. So the idea is that um, we'll be able to see some vertical information from the model in the sheet below, in the vertical curtain below, and some surface two-dimensional information from the, from the window above. Um, and there's a scale here of five kilometers for you that applies to this curtain, vertical curtain. So what I'll do is I'll play the, play the animation and we'll be able to see the inflow coming through and we can see it show up in the plan view on the surface, but also um, in the vertical curtain on the bottom there. And a couple of things to note is that clearly the water coming in from the catchments uh, is fresh, it's blue, um, and it is a surface overflow. And the reason it's a surface overflow is because fresh water is less dense than salt water. And so when fresh water enters the system, it floats across the top, or it scoots across the top of the, of the salty water in the ocean. And it's very clear in the curtain down the bottom that that's occurring. There is definitely some mixing in the vertical, um, but, but predominantly this inflow is, um, is a surface inflow. And also if we look at the extent of the plume there, um, it's just replaying itself now. Look at the extent of the plume. It sort of does extend to 40 to 50 kilometers offshore. It's a significant event um, and um, we'll look at some of the environmental impacts associated with that event um, in the subsequent animations. So um, that was salinity. Now we're going to look at sediment. We said that when we had the fresh water coming into the model, we attached some sediment to it. Well, this is the results from the model prediction of that sediment load. Um, the, the figure on the right hand side is exactly the same layout as I just showed you, except now we're plotting suspended sediment concentrations instead of salinity. And I've also clipped the sediment concentrations um, contours below 20 milligrams per litre. So any concentrations below 20 milligrams per litre are invisible in this animation. And that's just to show the plume extents a bit more clearly. Um, and the range of sediment concentrations is, is zero to a thousand milligrams a litre. So if I play this, um, we will see um, the red plume come out of the river and make its way across, across the domain, sort of like we saw for salinity, particularly, uh, it's particularly similar because it's a surface overflow as we expect, because the sediment is attached to the fresh water, which is a surface overflow. The plume does extend out into the middle of the model, but it does also run up and down the coast. You can see uh, the, the, the sediment plume is running longshore uh, in a northwesterly direction up the coastline the left-hand side of the figure here. So yes, it does come out of the bay, but it also runs along the coastline. Um, and we'll see that again and again as we look at these results. So the, we have a quite a defined plume down to 20 milligrams per litre. Um, it's a surface overflow as expected. The concentrations of sediment decrease from the source because there is dilution going on. But also this sediment can fall out too. We, we say it's a sediment overflow, 
um, because it's scooting across the top of the ocean. And that's true. But the sediment can also fall out of the water column down onto the bed and smother coral or seagrass. Now, we haven't simulated that in this particular example, but that can happen as well. So having looked at salinity and sediment, now look at light. The hydrodynamic model um, does affect, uh, the hydrodynamic model does um, also predict um, light. Now, what is light? Um, it's photosynthetically active radiation. There's some big words. We're just going to call it PAR or PAR. And it's just the daylight that we see. It's shortwave radiation from the sun. It's with us during the day. It's absent during the night. Plants and animals need this to live. Uh, and so light that comes into the water column um, is, is taken up or is used by plants and animals to grow and survive. There's definitely natural attenuation of light as it travels from the top to the bottom of a perfectly healthy water column. And we can sort of see that on the right-hand side. We can see that um, uh, decrease in light intensity from top to bottom in, in healthy water columns. But when we have a sediment inflow like we just saw that comes across the top of a system or, or moves through a, a, an ecosystem, the sediment in that water can cut out light a lot more than would naturally occur. And although obviously plants and animals can handle zero light conditions because the sun goes down at nighttime and they survive overnight, obviously, prolonged reductions in light can be a problem for some species of plants and animals. And so if we have plumes of sediment entering the coastal ocean, for example, and cutting out light for a long time, like days to weeks to even months, then we could expect problems to occur. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to look at these light um, predictions from the two flow FE model um, because of that potential for adverse um, impacts on, on biota. And, and also low visibility is, is you know, what we might think about in diving conditions. We, we can't see very well when there's lots of sediment in the water column. So it's that scenario that we're looking at. So there's no animations for this, but there's two stills. Uh, there's two, two sets of stills I'll show you here. Um, and these two stills are from the same time um, in, in two different simulations. The simulation on the left does not have the inflow we just looked at, so that's a bit of a base case. The still on the right does have the inflow, and what we're plotting up here is colour contours is PAR, or shortwave radiation, or light. And this is a mid-simulation. So what we can see on the left is we've got a really nice coverage of light at this particular time, a couple of hundred watts per square metre, and importantly, we have light reaching all the way down to the bottom of the water column on our familiar A to B track um, here at the river mouth. And we can see we've got light all the way to the bottom. So plants and animals who live on the bottom are doing well because they can get the light. However, on the right-hand side, we have the same simulation exactly as the left, but we have included the inflow with sediment. And what we can see is a very big dark blue area where light has been cut out or removed from the system because of the sediment. And this is the place we saw the sediment plume um, in the previous animation. But not only in the surface do we see this, but we see it all the way to the bottom. And, and this, this curtain will show us that there's a little bit of light at the top um, from A to B here, but beneath that PAR or light is essentially zero. And that can be very um, problematic for species of plants and animals that live um, at the bottom of the water column. So this is mid-simulation. At the end of the simulation, which is uh, many, many days later, again, without the inflow, we're looking fine. We've got light all the way through the water column, no problems for a simulation without the inflow. With the inflow, we still have this sediment distributed over most of the model domain and blocking out a lot of light below it. In fact, this sediment and the light blocking is going almost off to the continental shelf. It's that expansive and extensive. And, and this is the sort of situation we'd look at it and say, well, there's a big plume that's sitting there for a long time, blocking out light over a long period of time. This might have some impacts on coral or seagrass or whatever it might be. And that's why we'd bother looking at light in these models. So we've looked at um, salinity, sediment and light. Now we're going to look at phytoplankton. Remember we said that when we had the rivers coming into the domain, we attached to them sediment and nutrients. So we should expect to see some delivery of nutrients into the coastal zone, um, similar to what we saw for sediments. But what we've plotted up here is phytoplankton concentrations and, and phytoplankton is algae. It's, it's um, 
phytoplankton that, that grow in the water column as a result of nutrient uptake. Uh, and in similar way to sediment, um, just for presentation purposes, I've, I've clipped the phytoplankton contours in the top panel at five micrograms per litre. So anything below five micrograms per litre will not show up, but will give us a nice idea of the extent of the plume. Here's the colour bar here as it was before. So I'll play the animation. We can see a little bit of a blob of initial conditions coming out into the, into the ocean, but really nothing happens for a little while um, until the, the plumes have gone out into the bay, which is happening now. And then around the outside of the plume, we start to see phytoplankton growth. Now, why is that? Well, the phytoplankton growth firstly takes a while. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Phytoplankton does take a little while to grow. Um, but it's happening around the edge of the, of the plume because that's where there's enough light for the phytoplankton to grow. It's away from the sediment areas that are cutting out light. It's just on the edges of the plume where there is nutrients, but not too much sediment. So the light can be there to help the, the phytoplankton grow. And that's why we see the, the plume evolve around the outside initially. The thing to look for as the video replays here, the thing to look for after that initial outbreak around the edges of the plume, the thing to look for is that phytoplankton moving onshore and it moves uh, onshore. And when it does so, the concentrations actually start to increase. We start getting up into the orange and red territory, which is very high, 40 to 50 micrograms a litre. Why does it do that? Well, once the phytoplankton is onshore, there's plenty of nutrients around because of the blue, uh, because of the, the delivery from the river. But the water in the coastal areas here is warmer and phytoplankton like to grow in warm waters. So not only do we have nutrients um, throughout the domain, but we also have much warmer water on the coastline and that's why those blooms occur. Now that means we might have a potential interaction between phytoplankton blooms and people because people like to go to the beaches, obviously. So whilst we do have that delayed um, growth of phytoplankton in the domain, we do have this onshore drift of potentially toxic or at least um, allergenic um, phytoplankton. And that's again, one of the reasons why we'd want to see a water quality model of this particular event. So what's happened here? Well, simply with the river on pollutant delivery, we've said nutrients are delivered in the inflow with a combination of light and warm water, we generate phytoplankton blooms and we better watch out because some of those blooms interact with the beach. And we might end up with situations like this where we have green algal waves coming up on the beach. That could be bad. So what do we say to our Marine Authority who asked us to look at this issue? We say ecology could be shaded for prolonged periods of time um, and phytoplankton blooms are likely. We also might have some human health impacts um, around detritus um, and potential toxicity. Um, and again, conservative passive tracer simulation will not tell us this because it cannot simulate phytoplankton growth. Okay, moving into our second common issue is the pests from the ship ballast. And this real world but hypothetical example is that federal government, for example, has uh, commissioned a environmental impact statement of a proposed port. We'll say the port is in here. And one of the issues in the environmental impact statement is about the introduction of pests, marine pests into the environment as a result of ships coming from elsewhere and then releasing their ballast water. So we'll use a particle tracking module um, in the two flow simulation over four days to look at two scenarios of those particle tracks. We'll simulate two vessels. Um, both the vessels will start down here. One will move up the coast on the outside and one will move through the middle of this island channel here. And they'll have different, the two, two scenarios will run of those two tracks. One will have um, a mix of winds uh, and one will have predominantly southeast winds. And what we'll do is we'll see how those particle tracks differ in those two scenarios in relation to sensitive receptors in the area. Those sensitive receptors are hypothetically a whale habitat to the north and pristine beaches to the south. Again, I'm not suggesting that this is real. This is just an example for us to see how these particles might interact with these zones. So let's have a look at the animation um, and pay particular attend to, attention to the wind vane here because this will tell you really what's happening with the particles. So this first scenario, you'll see two ship tracks and the wind is mixed. It's in a very, uh, a, a range of different uh, directions um, and the tides are as per they were before. So you can see there's not a lot of interaction of the particles with the pristine beaches to start with um, as the two vessels make their way into the port, it's proposed. 
but as the simulation goes on, the wind moves to the, uh, to the southeast, northwest, and some particles do end up on that beach, that pristine beach, but almost none, almost none uh, make their way into the whale habitat. Um, this is quite different to the next simulation that we'll look at, which is predominantly southeast winds, but otherwise exactly the same. So it's exactly the same simulation, same boats, uh, same hydrodynamics, except the winds are different. And we'll see that immediately the particles from the outer track interact with the pristine beach. Um, and that wind is pushing strongly to the Northwest and all those particles that contain potential pests move right through the whale habitat zone. So those simulations were identical other than the wind, the wind applied to the model. And you can see there's substantial interaction between these two sensitive receptor areas and the particles. So what do we say to our, uh, EI, or to our federal government in the EIS? We say, we need to do more simulations. We can't just do two, we need to do more, but the interaction of pests with local biota is likely dependent on wind conditions. Uh, and so particularly southeasterlies might provide conditions where we might have some impact on the wild habitat or the beaches. Um, and we need to then talk about those environmental impacts and how we might mitigate or manage those. Finally, and it's the last couple of slides, um, we'll look at an aquaculture scenario. So, so this scenario, uh, again, using the same model, but uh, the scenario is that a global aquaculture country, uh, company uh, wants to set up a sea cage operation um, in this model domain that we're looking at uh, and, and grow some fish. Um, again, no suggestion this is uh, happening or has happened. It's just a hypothetical example. But let's pretend that there was four, four groups of cages that want to be, uh, want to be uh, implemented by this company. Um, the federal, state and local governments have all said, yeah, we need some assessment of this, please. Um, let's set some models up to have a look at some potential impacts. Now, this diagram on the right-hand side shows us just some of the processes that can be simulated around uh, sea cages, uh, sea cage operations. We will just look at ammonia release and phytoplankton growth and solid waste deposition. The ammonia release comes from dissolved fish waste or dissolved fish overfeed directly into the water column. The solid waste is again from overfeed or solid fish waste, and that goes to the bottom. We'll use the water quality module to look at ammonium and phytoplankton, and we'll look at the we'll use the particle tracking module to look at the solid waste. In a similar way, we looked at the catchment outflows. Um, water quality is about dissolved constituents, and the particle tracking module is about um, individual non-dissolved constituents. This is what a typical farm might look like. Um, it's a group of cages, and in those cages, are fish are grown. Um, we've simulated four sea cage clusters, and like I said, we've used the particle tracking module and the water quality module. What we'll do in the model is we'll input ammonium in each of these cages in the model, and we'll input in the water quality module, and we'll input particles in the particle tracking module to, to represent overfeed and waste. And the simulation goes for eight days. We look at ammonium and chlorophyll and particles. Okay, here's our familiar animation pane again. Now we're looking at ammonium concentrations in the water quality module, um, but our farms are lined up along this white line here. So we've, we've got rid of our A to B line over here and we've changed it to a line here, which is where the farms will be. And as a result, our curtain goes from the Southwest to the Northeast. So this end of the curtain is here and this end of the curtain is there. Um, I'll play this and you'll see for ammonia, immediately we have ammonia release into the environment. Uh, and as a vertical curtain shows us, it's mainly in the surface layers, not always. There's some mixing, but it's mainly in the surface layers. And the plume is fairly well confined. So that's something we could, we could report. Confined to the scale of the aquaculture operation, which is um, you know, 20 to 30 kilometers, that's the same scale as the plume is of ammonium. But it's a local impact of considerable concentration, but it's confined to the surface. So that's the beginning of our environmental assessment is that result. If we now look at exactly the same simulation, except now we'll look at chlorophyll A concentrations. If I start that animation again, um, it has started. You can see the arrow moving there. Again, we don't see any immediate impacts. And that's because like we saw last time, phytoplankton takes a little while to grow. And it also likes to grow in the coastal zones, the coastal regions. And you'll see very shortly, some concentrations of phytoplankton begin to pop up again on the coastline. Why? because it takes a while for phytoplankton to grow and coastal, warm, uh, coastal waters are warmer. And that's where phytoplankton grows particularly well. 
So you would have seen some red blobs pop, pop up there. That's high concentrations of phytoplankton. So the effects are not immediate and they're not local. And that's quite different to the ammonia response we looked at before. So what are we seeing again? We're seeing ammonium released into the environment with light and warm water gives us phytoplankton blooms. We've got a local acute impact from ammonia. Remember right back to the beginning, we talked about acute impacts. Well, ammonium is local and acute. Phytoplankton is non-local and chronic. So that's the spectrum we need to look at again. And finally, um, just the particles that we dropped into the water at each sea cage. This is what the particle tracking model tells us. Um, zooming in a bit, the particles on the bed are about six kilometers apart, as we'd expect. Within one cage area, they're about a kilometer. It's about a one, one to two kilometer radius of particles that have settled on the floor beneath each cage. And we report that as well. So what do we say to our government? We say ammonium is likely to deliver toxic, uh, acute toxicity. We need to be aware of that in the area of the cages. It might also be a problem for the fish. So we might want to look at that in a bit more detail. Chronic issues from phytoplankton might arise, but at distances from the sea cages. Or we might actually report these results to our customers and work with our customers to refine the sea cage design and do some remodeling and then report to the government. Either way, we're managing environmental impacts. Very briefly, uh, data needs. Um, we do need a lot of data to undertake water quality modeling. That's, that's certainly the case. We need more than just a uh, water level, of course. Um, we do need hydrodynamics to support water quality quarter quality modeling. And Mitch talked about a few of those data needs in his webinar. But for water quality, what we need is really to do the job where we need continuous data and usually dissolved oxygen and turbidity and fluorescence will be useful. And fluorescence is a measure of phytoplankton concentrations because chlorophyll uh, fluoresces. But we also need to have grab samples of nutrients and phytoplankton speciations. Um, they're really important. Now I know that data collection programs are expensive and we can't just go and collect data forever. So the plans we come up with need to be targeted and robust so they can appropriately support model development. And we should always look at not just a snapshot in time for water quality modeling, uh, monitoring data. We need to look at different states of the tide, uh, different seasons, uh, wetter months, drier months, cooler months, warmer months. And we need to try and make sure we have enough data so that we can characterize if required, long-term or chronic and short-term and acute um, processes that we've been talking about today. So look, we're at the end now, uh, Trevor, but um, what we've talked about today is that coastal water quality modeling is an essential part of environmental impact assessment. It's only one part, but it's essential really. And numerical tools can help us understand all sorts of risks and how we might eliminate them. Um, and impacts can be direct or indirect, water column or in the benthic uh, regions, acute, chronic, local, non-local. And so they're complicated. And that's why we need non-conservative water quality models to help us out. Because without those, we really don't have that robustness of assessment that we need to address these ongoing impacts that might occur as a result of proposals, proposed developments to our coastal zone. That's all from me, Trevor. What a brilliant presentation. M much animation and much graphics. Thanks so much. Am I coming through okay? You are, Trevor. Thank you. Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, so the questions have been good. Thank you, everybody, for those questions. It's been really good, and we're down to zero questions. Emma and Mitch must have worn out your fingers in your <laughs> responses, but thank you very much. That's been brilliant. Well, um, we've got a couple of minutes to the end of the hour. If you've got any comments to, uh, to to add, we don't have to go to the full hour. We can finish finish early. That's great, too. Uh, everybody's still on board with us, I can see. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us. It's been a most interesting uh, discussion. Um, covering a lot of ground yes indeed. it's complicated trevor that's why <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's in that cup coffee or uh, it's water trevor Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can imagine the complication would drive you to something a bit stronger than water water <laughs> um we've had a question come through from brett sinclair and i suppose if you do have any other questions that you were um wanting to get out and haven't been answered yet then feel free to put them out um, so, Michael, I might get you to answer this one. Uh, can two flows simulate groundwater discharges carrying nutrients to the coastal environment uh, mm, in the middle or the lower parts of the water column? Indeed, yeah. And, and that's something we often have to deal with in the coastal zone is that interaction of a, a freshwater uh, groundwater inflow into a marine or salty environment. And so the way we've usually simulated that before is to have um, areas as polygons in the two flow model where we want the inflow to occur. But what we do is we say to two flow, 
don't have that fresh water inflow across the whole water column, just have it coming in at the bed. And so um, we provide two flow with a profile of that inflow, vertical profile of where the inflow should be. We have no, no inflow for the top 95% of the water column and then 5% at the bottom. Sorry, 100% for the bottom 5%. And that's where all the water will come into the model from groundwater. So you can really have an inflow at any level of the bathymetry you like by using that vertical, vertical profile of, um, of, the, of describing the way that fresh water is introduced into the system. Uh, it does lead to very interesting dynamics because we have, when we have fresh water coming in from a groundwater flow near the bottom of a model, it'll want to mix and move upwards because as we saw, it's less dense than the surrounding seawater. So those interactions are not simple and need to be looked at carefully, but that would be the way we do it is by forcing that flow to be at the bed to whatever depth you'd like. Okay, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I guess if there's any other, other questions. Um, I think one of the interesting one that came came through was regarding looking at trying to model uh, fish catch or the yield of, of fish in estuarine uh, hydrodynamics, and whether there was a you know way that you could do do that. Yeah, yeah certainly that's something that um, we have worked with aquaculture operators with in the past because that yield is not only a function of how much the fish are fed, for example it's a function of how healthy the fish are and that is a reflection of the quality of the water they're living in. So we need to make sure that we can provide a, a higher quality of water for the fish to live and grow in so that our yields are what we want them to be. If the quality of the water is not up to it, we can feed the fish as much as we like and they're not going to grow as we would like them to. So, so yes, we have talked about that with fish operators and there are uh, some ways that we can relate um, fish feed with fish growth and link in water quality. It's a fairly new area uh, for us at the moment, but it's certainly something that we're looking at um, better uh, developing our skills in the future. Okay, great. Did anyone have any final final questions or probably go have a nice cup of tea or coffee early if you want? All right. Well, maybe we'll uh, call it a day right there. And, um, and thank you once again, Michael, Mitchell and Emma um, really appreciate the effort going into this from Two Flow team. Uh, and of course, also a big shout out to the Australian Water School team, Joel, Renee, Jess, Joe. Thanks a lot for your, your continual work. Without you, impossible to have this happen. Um, just on the screen there, we're going to re re have, a, have a, re got a recording of this and we're going to email that to you, uh, email that link to you. Uh, also, um, there's a live attendee certificate of attendance coming to you uh, and a short one minute survey is going to pop up. I might remind everyone also um, about the upcoming two flow, here we go, webinars um, each month uh, from now till November. Uh, keep it in mind, it's an absolutely fantastic, almost must have uh, in your tool toolkit as modelers. It's been great. I appreciate everybody being here today and. Uh, and for the effort everybody's put in. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and your questions were great. You can see there, there's three columns, on-demand courses, webinars, and live courses. Australian Water School is just uh, firing on all four, firing flat out. With, it's, a, it's a great time to be doing this sort of thing, especially with Zoom and electro electronic uh, communications. It's wonderful. All right, well, that's enough for today. And uh, uh, what a great time to be had by everybody. Thanks, everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing you at the next uh, webinar. Thanks Bye for now. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water. Visit the AustralianWaterSchool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.